Hi everybody, it's November 6, 2017. I have been looking at this worldview, NASA's worldview, for, I don't know, about 10 days, every single day, several times a day. And I am really struck with how much geoengineering is taking place, especially in NATO countries. Now, I'm going to let this play from August 7, to the current date and check out how much geoengineering is taking place. It's really remarkable. The planet is being dumped with chemicals, heavy metals, all over the place. But I'm going to ask you at the end, have you noticed anything that seems a little odd, that kind of stands right out in your face? Did you notice? I will link below to this worldview and you can click on the link below. You can play it or you can stop it and you can check out your own country and how much you are being pummeled, saturated, and really toxic, very toxic chemicals and heavy metals that affect our health and affect all life, affect the planet. But if you zoom in, you can see very clearly the lines that make it very obvious that these are not clouds. Uh, you guys in the UK, so many days could I hardly even see Ireland, Scotland, and England. It's really remarkable, but not a surprise to me that I'm hearing from people in Europe, um, Denmark, Ireland, Scotland, England, um, other European countries, as well as um, Canadians and those in the United States, all of you not feeling well from those that I've heard from. But you can see that we are being saturated in this stuff. But I do want to bring your attention to Africa. Africa, Saudi Arabia, Israel, even Iran, um, Iraq some days, Turkey some days. But yeah, Turkey, NATO country, sorry, you're also getting hit and saturated. But I did notice, having looked for a while, well, let's just play it right through from October 4. And here we are, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, November 1, 2, 3, 4. Wow. Saudi Arabia, in particular, is clean. Israel gets hit every now and then. Turkey does. But North Africa, Saudi Arabia, and I will show you the map. Uh, these countries here, Northern Africa, Saudi Arabia, as well as uh, Yemen and Oman, Oman, um, Iraq seems to be somewhat uh, saved a lot, Iran and Israel, Lebanon, Syria, though some days they do make it into Syria, Azerbaijan, sorry, you're saturated as well, um, which is right up here. Okay. Is this by order of the uh, royal family in Saudi Arabia that they do not want any geoengineering over their country? And, well, I tried to do some research on Northern Africa in particular because Southern African nations also get pummeled. Australia, you seem to be uh, not so saturated as we are but you definitely get hit as well. But there's a lot of areas of Australia, like 
central or middle Australia seems to be pretty good as well. Um, yeah. All right. Well, I did a video. I posted a video on my original Kafka Winston World channel on a document that I found. It was pertaining to the United Nations and how the United Nations has 10 regions of the world when they will finally announce their world government, 10 regions. And in that document, all I can remember is the United States would be the world's prison nation. <laughs> but Africa was going to be the continent or the region where the world would place its, it would be the tech hub, it would be the technology hub. Now there are an awful lot of um, tech companies moving to Africa, but these tech companies are not solely in Northern Africa. Many of them are in Southern Africa, South Africa, so that doesn't really explain it. The United Nations is aggressively pushing Agenda 2030 for a sustainable development, as well as Agenda 2063 in Africa. And I will link below to all of these uh, United Nations documents. Don't you wish that more people would just kind of wander over to the United Nations website and check out Agenda 2030. So there is an African Union cooperation. They are embracing all of the nations in Africa have embraced Agenda 2030. Not the people of Africa, but the governments of Africa. And in fact, I came across this document, the Africa we want in 2030. 2063 and beyond. And who is we? It's the United Nations, the Office of the Special Advisor on Africa, which is a United Nations office, and they too are pushing Agenda 2030 and Agenda 2063 for Africa. And wow, Africa, well, you guys are also going to have your stack and packs. Um, the government of Sweden, the Africa we want in 2030, 2063. The government of Sweden gets to decide the Africa they want instead of the people of Africa, the nation's people. The African Union is, it's a continental union consisting of all 55 countries on the African continent, established um, on 26, the 26th of May, 2001, in Ethiopia, and launched on July 9, 2002, in South Africa, with the aim of replacing the organization of African unity. That replacement I think that they were having difficulty getting the heads of the governments in this organization of African unity to agree to Agenda 2030. And I think Gaddafi was a very powerful voice to make sure that the organization of African unity did not agree to what the United Nations wanted. But they got rid of Gaddafi, and they have gotten rid of the Organization of African Unity. So now it is the African Union. I want you to listen to just a few minutes of this. Now, also understand that I believe the Trump administration has given over $60 billion to Africa just recently. But here we go. It's pumping huge sums of money into Africa in the hope its troops, weapons, and mercenaries will turn a land of conflict into a land of hope. 
as you can see here, American military bases are spread all across the continent. The biggest outpost for the U.S. on the Horn of Africa is in Djibouti, which now hosts more than 4,000 military personnel and contractors. Also, thousands of U.S. soldiers are reportedly preparing for missions as part of the Pentagon's new strategy to train and advise regional forces. RT's Paula Slear investigates what could be behind Washington's military boost. Hundreds of millions of American dollars are flowing into Africa as the Pentagon ups its spending on the continent. There's plenty of raw materials here, Nigeria a case in point. The West African nation is America's fourth largest supplier of crude oil, accounting for 11% of all U.S. oil imports. The American government has a lot of investment in Nigeria. They have uh, invested so much in the oil and gas sector, and they need to protect that. And that, believes Raf Sanjani, is the real reason for U.S. troop expansion in Africa, not to bring democracy, not to help the local populations, but to protect American interests and justify their reasons for being here. The poor governance in Nigeria, which led to you know, the collapse of uh, um, you know, accountability, transparency, and of course, you know, the violence, the uh, different socioeconomic and political crisis in the country has now provided you know, a legitimate in terms of American foreign policy uh, reasons to actually come into Nigeria Africa is dotted with U.S. bases and a growing constellation of small American drone outposts. Camp Lemonir, north of Somalia, has been America's main facility on the continent for nearly a decade. It houses about 4,000 military and civilian personnel. But at the end of last year, it was forced to stop flying drones in the area after a string of crashes and growing anger from locals. Problem is, U.S. forces are getting stretched very thin. They're being tasked with missions that are well beyond their numerical and logistics capability right now. And the danger with Africa, like all foreign interventions, uh, is that new conflicts expand from them, and all the next thing you know, suddenly you're out of troops and out of money to sustain these missions. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry says... What's happening in Africa is so exciting overall, and we are really deeply uh, engaged and, and, and the president uh, has instructed us uh, to really try to uh, light our fire under our efforts uh, in, throughout the continent. But what's not so exciting is the growth of jihadists and anti-Western groups across the continent. Thousands of American soldiers are gearing up for missions as part of the Pentagon's new strategy to train and advise African militaries to deal with the threat. It's not impressing those who live here. The Americans have failed to combat terrorism in Afghanistan or anywhere else, and the same will happen here in West Africa. It's likely that their presence will even bring the terrorist threat to Senegal. But the president does his calculations saying, well, this will allow me to be a good friend of the United States, maybe attract some investment or strengthen my security forces. But from the point of view of the Senegalese people, we risk losing an awful lot. A number of African leaders have expressed concern about the potential militarization of the continent, fearful that America's expanding presence will bode badly for Africa and her people. Paula Slea, RT. And it will, absolutely. So I want to see it's if this... It's not just Eastern Africa suffering... Yes, here. Listen to this. ...from the threat of extremists. Of course, it's a problem occurring continent-wide, and because of that, President Trump now has been increasing the U.S. presence there great expense to American taxpayers. Miguel Francis Santiago reports on that side of it. You remember Trump's America First tagline, right? Well, U.S. tax dollars are currently being spent on a military intervention in Africa. 1,500 troops are now stationed in the region. So what are they fighting in Africa? Terrorists. Okay. And how's that going? Well, apparently not all that well, at least not in Niger. The growing foreign military footprint in the country appears to have set a local backlash against both the government and Western countries. And it gets worse. Four U.S. soldiers were killed as they tried to advance deeper into the African Islamist territory. Niger, by the way, happens to be the country housing the largest contingent of U.S. troops in Africa. There were just a hundred of them in 2013 under Obama administration. But now, with America first, 
It's 800 U.S. troops. It's a pretty broad mission with the government of Niger in order to increase their capability to stand alone and to prosecute violent extremists in the region. And according to a White House document, as of June this year, there are now 300 U.S. troops in Cameroon. That's an additional whole 15 more troops since December 2016. Now, that's a serious increase that no doubt requires a serious budget, right? No way, you may say, but oh yes, just this Wednesday, the Acting Assistant Secretary for African Affairs asked for $5.2 billion tax dollars as it's the required budget for African assistance in 2018. Okay, but why so much money? Because of the size of Africa, because of the time and space and the distances, when it comes to especially crisis response type activities, we need access in various places uh, on the continent. $5.2 billion. That's a lot of money for putting America first. So, um, <clears throat> do we not have an awful lot of Americans who are in great need of financial help? And we give billions and billions and billions and billions to other countries. American taxpayers foot the bill. But we also have our troops all over the world. American taxpayers foot the bill. What? What is our interest in all of these countries? We don't have any interest, but our government, our military, oh, and the United Nations absolutely does have a very big interest. But why are Americans allowing this to go on when we need help here? But the money that we send to the IRS goes into other nations. And it's not for humanitarian reasons. It's not to bring peace and prosperity and democracy to Africa. It is to take over their resources. So you cannot believe these military spokespeople when they come out and say, well, we've got to be there because um, terrorism, terrorist groups are, are now coming out of the closet in Africa, in African nations. They are now coming out of the closet because of the United States military presence all over, all over Africa. The U.S. military is conducting secret missions all over Africa. U.S. troops are now conducting 3,500 exercises, programs, and engagements per year, an average of nearly 10 missions per day on the African continent. With the White House and the Pentagon facing questions about the October 4 ambush in Niger, in which, in which four U.S. Special Forces soldiers were killed, Secretary Mattis reportedly indicated to two senior members of the Senate Armed Service Committee Friday that these numbers are only likely to increase as the U.S. military shifts even greater attention to counterterrorism in Africa. We cause the counterterrorism wherever we go. It's obvious. It's in our face. We foot the bill for our military to take over countries. And it will only stop if Americans demand it to stop, but we need to be unified in that. And it doesn't seem likely that that is ever going to happen. So Senator Lindsey Graham, oh yes, of South Carolina said, you're going to see more actions in Africa, not less. You're going to see more aggression by the United States toward our enemies, not less. You're going to have decisions being made, not in the White House, but out in the field. Great. But the U.S. military has already seen significant action in Africa where its growth has been sudden and explosive. Our military is also, I think, being used by the United Nations to be the force behind the implementation of Agenda 2030 and Agenda 2063 to bring it about rather fast. 
it's also there to be the private security of major corporations in Africa. But let's see, 2008, um, we had 172 missions, activities, programs, and exercises from other combatant commands, and that was uh, of U.S. military operations. Five years in, that number shot up to 546. There has been an astounding 1,900% increase since the command was activated less than a decade ago and suggests a major expansion of U.S. military activities on the African continent. Yeah, AFRICOM. AFRICOM. AFRICOM, I believe, established uh, a decade ago. I might be a little off on, the, uh, on when it was, actually. Created, established, um, you know, going back to the Obama days, 2015, September 27th, fact sheet, U.S. Global Development Policy and Agenda. I will link below to everything. You can read it. But here, Obama is assigning over to the United Nations the agreement to establish Agenda 2030 in our country as well as around the world. And who's footing the bill? It is primarily the American taxpayer. Under the Obama administration, the United States has committed and helped mobilize more than $100 billion in new funding from other donors and the private sector to fight poverty in the areas of health, food, security, and energy. In the United States, the adoption of the 2030 Agenda coincides with the growing bipartisan consensus on the importance of global development and direct philanthropic contributions from the American people. Have Were we asked? No. No. That money was just taken from us. And we are actually footing the bill for our own demise. The loss of our freedom, the loss of our private property rights, the loss of our individual rights, the loss of our sovereignty, because Agenda 2030 is a global plan that ultimately will have a one world government, a one world religion, where the people of the world will be global citizens enslaved by the elite. That's where all of this is going. So I will link below to these articles, the United Nations Agenda 2030, a recipe for global socialism. And I just want to read you uh, this paragraph. Now in, uh, when was it? I think it was in 2015 when they had the 70th Annual General Assembly at the United Nations headquarters in New York, and they adopted this dr draconian 15-year master plan for the planet. Top globalists such as former NATO chief Javier Solana, a socialist, they were celebrating the plan, which the summit unanimously approved as the next, quote, great leap forward, unquote, and if you know anything about the great leap forward of the Chinese Communist Party, your stomach probably sank. This was announced at the 70th Annual General Assembly, the great leap forward. But Africa, the African Union, all nations have signed on have signed on and you've got your murdering these horrific dictators in African nations not all of them but here it all sounded so wonderful to some of the world's most brutal dictators that they could hardly contain their glee this agenda promises a brave new world a new world 
which we have to consciously construct, a new world that calls for the creation of a new global citizen that was gushed from the Marxist dictator Robert Mugabe, the genocidal mass murderer enslaving Zimbabwe, in Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe, who also serves as the chairman of the African Union. These people don't care about the people who live in their nations. They only care about themselves. So they are rewarded with an awful lot of luxuries to implement Agenda 21. He went on to say, I want to believe that we are up to this task that we have voluntarily and collectively committed ourselves to our success. And in particular, the promise of a new world that awaits us depends upon this commitment. He also promised to vigorously impose the United Nations Agenda 2030 on the starving and impoverished victims his regime lords over with Agenda 2030 style policies. And Venezuela, Maduro, Castro, Cuba, they're all pushing it in their countries as well. The United Nations, the global citizen, common core, it teaches the younger generations not about their own countries, traditions and values and history. They are teaching the young to be global citizens and they are manipulating them to take on the task to impose the United Nations Agenda 2030, the master plan, manipulating them to work with their parents because they're being taught how fabulous this is going to be. It's going to save the earth. And everybody is going to be lifted up out of poverty. No, everybody is going to be pushed in to a universal income. No one will have any rights to own anything. And everybody will be getting a very, very small universal income that will barely sustain their life. I will do recommend this uh, Grind All 61 video. The formation of the one world government is happening right before our eyes. This was back in 2015. All of this is now being implemented very aggressively in all nations. And, you know, Agenda 2030, all agendas are connected. So when you see this massive gen, uh, geoengineering taking place all, all over the world uh, with some uh, fortunate countries clearly not being hit at all, but the NATO countries, the European countries, the United States, and Australia as well, Depopulation is part of that agenda, Agenda 2030. So they truly are terraforming the entire Earth, the entire planet, taking away all natural processes and bringing in everything artificial, but truly bringing in a, a, a incredibly poisonous world where most people will not be able to adapt to any of this. We will simply die. Isn't that great? But I've never seen the kind of geoengineering taking place on the East Coast of the United States as I have in the recent weeks. And years ago when I was on satellites I would watch what was taking place and this kind of geoengineering you could see in the Pacific off off the west coast 
but not the East Coast. But now we are getting pummeled. And you can see all of the frequencies being used as well. God. You know, to survive this, the only thing that I can suggest to everybody is detoxing every single day and, you know, exercise and strengthening your immune system. That is the only, that is the best antidote to survive this enormous dumping of toxins that we breathe. And when you think about the dumping of nanobots, the nanotechnology that we are ingesting, breathing, those nanobots that can cross the blood-brain barrier, the use of frequencies can actually trigger those nanobots in our bodies, in our brains. Well, that is, that certainly is a recipe for full control. So if you have not seen the world view, uh, the link is below and you can come on over and you can see how unbelievably saturated we are from all of this. And you know, there have been days when South Carolina has been clear, literally no spraying whatsoever, which always makes me wonder, all right, what the hell are they doing when you get hit so often and then they stop and it's like, oh, okay, I'd like to know why you stopped. But I would go out for a walk and I came back and there was absolutely no spraying and my eyes were burning, my nose was burning. One day, I developed something in my chest where I could not stop coughing. Several days, I had headaches. For the past two weeks, we've had actually, uh, comparatively, compared to what I have noticed here since I've lived here, we've had almost no spring. So you would think that, you know, I would be feeling better. There were days when I had really bad headaches. I woke up consecutive days, like four days in a row, with a really bad headache. That only tells me that our atmosphere, the air that we are breathing now, is so saturated with all of these poisons that even on days when we can actually see the sky, though it's not terribly blue, it is a pale blue, but you're still getting sick. That simply means that the saturation of toxins, nothing is clearing it out anymore. It's here. It's here to stay. Look at that. This is incredibly dangerous and people are dying from this. People are getting sick, sick from this and it is astounding to me and it probably always will be that we cannot get through to our uh, fellow citizens in our respective countries. And it's so sad because it's not the human beings who are only affected by this, but all life, all life. The entire planet is being reshaped, terraformed for the elite, how they want it. And we have no say whatsoever. <laughs>